the our common purpose report came out of a commission that worked for two years. We had conversations around the country, including in Dover Foxcroft. Um, and those uh, conversations included um, really everybody from first year cadets at the Naval Academy to Somali refugees in the Minneapolis area to um, folks in rural communities in Indiana, uh, uh, political activists, conservative activists in Mississippi, um, uh, municipal uh, government officials in California, really a broad range of uh, uh, Americans from around the country to kind of get their perspectives on um, what's working and what's not working with our democracy and, and what their hopes and aspirations are um, to make it work better. Should mention that the uh, commission that we convened, which included um, leaders from the nonprofit sector, um, academia, civil society, politics, and business, um, people from across the ideological spectrum, uh, was convened by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The American Academy is based um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we go back uh, to 1780 to the founding of the country. Um, we were founded by uh, John Adams and John Hancock and other uh, leaders in the uh, movement for American independence and uh, who understood that uh, the then new republic would require institutions like the academy that could advance knowledge to help uh, serve the public good and address uh, challenges facing the new country. Um, so I can't think of anything more important than stewardship, uh, reinvention, uh, reinvigoration um, of American democracy uh, uh, as a, uh, a project or undertaking uh, true to the academy's uh, founding mission. Um, so we're very pleased to have you involved in the discussion. Part of the point of a report like this is to foster debate and discussion as well as in thinking about ways to advance uh, specific solutions and ideas. Um, so with that, I'll uh, dive in a little bit just to a very brief overview of the eight recommendations in uh, strategy one. And strategy one in our common purpose is really about achieving equality of voice and representation in our political institutions. I think there was a sense in the commission and from what we heard in our listening sessions around the country that many Americans feel left out and unheard by our political institutions, whether that's state and local government or federal government, and don't feel that their voice is adequately represented in those institutions. Uh, and so the commission undertook to recommend a number of uh, solutions that could help you know, include voices, um, conservative voices, rural voices, urban voices, that do feel left out. Uh, there are a number of ideas that we'd you know, love to discuss with you and, and get your response on. So first recommendation of the commission on, on this strategy is to substantially enlarge the House of Representatives. And so the commission did not pinpoint a number, but the idea behind this is really to rethink the cap that has existed on the number of members of the House since I think 1929. A second recommendation is one that I think is quite familiar to you all in the state of Maine, which is to introduce ranked choice voting in presidential, congressional, and state elections. Um, and so if that's a topic that you want to reflect on, we can come back to, come back to that and certainly we'll, we'll be interested in hearing uh, about your experience and the pros and cons of ranked choice voting in the Maine. Third recommendation is to give states the option to use multi-member districts on the condition that they adopt a non-winner-take-all election model like ranked choice voting. Um, we can come back to talk a little bit about the mechanics of that, but basically the idea is instead of splitting a state up into districts where there's just one representative in the house for each district, um, you could have larger districts and within those districts, you could have um, multiple representatives who perhaps represent a broader, uh, perhaps uh, represent a, a broader sections within that bigger uh, congressional district. Uh, fourth recommendation is to adopt independent citizen redistricting commissions in every state. Um, the idea is, uh, of course, here to combat gerrymandering um, or the idea that um, partisan state legislatures can construct districts that might uh, be to their political advantage by bringing in um, more independent, more neutral uh, citizens to draw those districts along uh, using methods that are less uh, driven towards partisan advantage. Fifth recommendation is to amend the US Constitution to authorize the regulation of election contributions uh, and spending to eliminate the undue influence of money in our political system. The sixth recommendation is to pass strong campaign finance disclosure laws in all 50 states that require full transparency for campaign donations. As some of you may be aware, uh, it is currently possible to donate money to LLCs and um, uh, nonprofit organizations where the uh, 
donor's uh, anonymity is, is preserved and doesn't have to be disclosed. Um, so this advocates for uh, fuller disclosure so that um, those who are uh, participating in campaign discourse, uh, uh, it's a little bit more clear where their funding is coming from. Seventh recommendation is to pass clean election laws for federal, state, and local elections through mechanisms such as public matching donation systems and democracy vouchers, which can amplify the power of small donors. Um, so certainly I know the state of Maine has some public funding for campaigns as well. That could be another other alternative here, but I think the idea is to um, help to, you know, those, for those candidates who are able to attract small dollars, it's to push back against the influence of the bigger money by amplifying the effect of those smaller, smaller dollar donations. And lastly, the eighth recommendation under this strategy is uh, targeted at the Supreme Court, um, and that is to establish 18 year term limits for Supreme Court justices. Um, and those appointments would be staggered so that you'd have one nomination for each uh, two year Congress um, or two nominations per presidential term. And I ju will just add for clarification here, there's you know been ideas in the news about increasing the size of the Supreme Court. The commission's recommendation was not to increase the size of the Supreme Court at all. It would be to establish term limits uh, for future appointments to the court. So this would take a long time to actually fully take effect. The existing members of the court would not be term limited. It would apply to, uh, to new appointees to the court. Um, and so over time, you would have a, a normalization of Supreme Court appointments. So let me stop there and invite uh, Sterling and Catherine to add anything important that I might have missed in the opening uh, overview? Uh, I have two questions. Number one, do all of us here agree that it's an issue that that our elected representatives don't listen to us? Do we all agree on that? And we think it's a problem. All right, my next question, I guess maybe this is for Peter and you guys. Did you guys discover what your respondents thought that if our representatives aren't listening to us, who are they listening to? Well, I, I certainly this gets this gets a bit at the recommendations around the influence of money and trying to reduce the influence of money in politics. I think there, there certainly was a sense from the listening sessions that people felt their voice didn't matter, their vote didn't matter, um, in part because you know, the loudest voices and the, and the, and the, and the voices with the most uh, monetary resources behind them uh, have, have undue and unfair influence over elected officials. And so that's uh, certainly, I think, you know, part of the reasoning for emphasizing uh, strong recommendations in, in this strategy for reducing the influence of money. And I should add the only recommend that the commission really tried to focus on things that were uh, relatively easy to implement. I don't think any of these things are easy to implement, but uh, there's only one recommendation for a constitutional amendment in here, um, recognizing that getting constitutional amendments passed is, is a very challenging thing to do. Um, and that one is on campaign finance because of the uh, urgency and importance of that issue. Um, and, you know, the alternative is you potentially wait for a different makeup of the Supreme Court to try to, uh, you know, reverse Citizens United and other, other rulings. Um, um, and that was seen as potentially even greater lift or greater long-term uh, challenge than passing a, a constitutional amendment. I infer from these eight recommendations that if the people were properly informed, that uh, that uh, we'd be listened to. There's nothing in here about how we get our information. These recommendations. That's an issue with me. Yeah, no, a very important point. I mean, so. Um, as uh, Tara mentioned in her in her opening, there are 31 recommendations, and these are these are eight under the first strategy. So um, uh, an important one in strategy six focuses on civic education, and not just K through 12 civic education, but lifelong civic education, uh, and the okay. importance of that. That uh, we've got a long ways to go um, to you know educate Americans even on the basics. I mean, you see some horrifying poll numbers about how many people know that there are three branches of government, for example. Um, you know, it's just some sim simple literacy things about how uh, the system works um, to start with. Um, so uh, that was certainly a point of emphasis as well. There's also a whole strategy and there's, I think, more work for us to do, um, but there's a, a the fifth strategy um, talks about uh, social media um, and um, trying to redefine or, or define a public purpose for social media, um, sort of recognizing that there's 
great possibility um, in the digital spaces for um, educating and convening and bringing people together. Um, nobody felt <laughs> that we'd really realized that possibility. There are obviously also great threats that we've uh, realized in terms of the spread of misinformation. And, um, uh, so you know, there are some strategies around um, you know, uh, creating uh, better spaces, better, better digital spaces for people to convene and share information and connect with one another. Um, but we still have some work to do to kind of, uh, you know, flesh out uh, what those would be. Okay, thank you. Strategy three, Chris, is to ensure the responsiveness of political institutions. And so you're right, if, if our elected officials were, were suddenly incentivized to listen to us because big money wasn't calling the tune, we'd still have to create kind of a renew, like, well, how do our elected officials sit down and talk to us? We know sometimes town hall meetings are just people shouting at the microphone to get their point of view out versus strategy three really asks like, how could we have meaningful conversations with groups of citizens and their elected officials? And, and, and so your question really raises the bigger issue that the commission struggled with, which is no one of these reforms is a, is a standalone solution, but together they start to interact. And it's not clear which ones of these might sort of be the breakthrough and in different places around the country. I mean, because Maine enjoys ranked choice voting, it's like you can just kind of check that off. You know, I, I don't know if it's universally beloved in Maine, but you're far ahead of the rest of the country and you sure did it better than New York City. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a great point about strategy three, which includes ideas around, you know, engaging citizens in actual deliberation and decision making. Um, so there are recommendations in there for things like participatory budgeting um, at the local level so that citizens can have some input into how uh, public money is spent um, and ideas uh, focused at the congressional level um, to engage representative groups of constituents and, you know, not just in sort of town halls where people, you know, member of Congress talks at the constituents and doesn't and, and packs the room full of people that agree with them, but actually getting together a group of people to work through a policy challenge together uh, and try to build some consensus around ideas. And that, that would be a group of people with you know, diverse points of views, representative sample from, from, from the uh, member of Congress's dis district. So it's not just their core supporters or their opponents yelling at them. Uh, but people working together on, uh, to try to figure out policy solutions to difficult, difficult challenges. As you have taken this around um, and, and done presentations on this, in general, who are the audiences that you are reaching? One of the things we want to do is begin having conversations that draw people in. But as you can see from the attendance here, um, it is really hard to engage people. And so I just bring that up as a kind of a, a uh, present moment experience that we're having and engaging people in that conversation. The other thing I wanted to raise is that I think your comment, Sterling, about, about civics education, I think that's a perfect um, conversation. I think we should be having a, um, a coffee house, a makeshift coffee house topic on civics education. I think that would be a great topic. What we hope to do is to really um, increase the number of contacts between people where we're having conversation because that's where the, common, the commonality becomes evident. And it doesn't work to just do it in sound bites on social media. That just is not an effective way to, to, um, to sway people. It just, it just pushes people into their own separate camps um, because they can cut out the things they don't like and only stream the things they like. And so it's only in person to person interaction, I think that we can do this. I am struggling. The reason why I uh, wanted to be part of the common purpose, and um, this is my third, I was looking for a strategy, but um, I'm struggling with, I am in favor of all of these recommendations, but what I'm struggling with is how can it be implemented? How can it be achieved when there's such a deadlock everywhere? It's so partisan everywhere. 
And you know, my little bit of hope and it keeps me going is that we had and how we got ranked choice voting is talking to all different people. I didn't even know whether they were Democrat, Republican, Greens, Independent, it didn't matter. They just wanted some information on ranked choice voting. And so that's my little bit of hope that we can move forward on some of these recommendations because I'm struggling with that because everything is so deadlocked. Yeah, and I think just an important point of emphasis too is that many of these recommendations are not, you know, we've talked a bit about Congress and constitutional amendments and things that require us to un, you know, break the log jam in, uh, in a dysfunctional Congress, but many of these are things that can be advanced at the local and state state level. And that's, you know, really where it's gonna have to have to happen first, right? To build that momentum. And Maine was a leader in ranked choice voting. You now have Alaska, I think, uh, 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 Sterling mentioned that Alaska has adopted ranked choice voting. Um, uh, uh, the Republican Party in Virginia just used it to pick their gubernatorial candidate. So uh, mm -hmm. it does have bipartisan interest and people are trying it out in different places. Um, and so just highlighting those success cases and highlighting that it's you know, pushing back against the notion that some of these ideas are partisan by pointing to examples of how different communities with different ideological leanings and different parties are, are using some of these things and experimenting with them. I, I think, Gloria, I think, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I take, I take um, hope because I see in my home state of Michigan, uh, where I had not lived for uh, many decades and went back there in 2006 to work at the Kellogg Foundation. And I was coming from California and Michigan had changed. I felt like Rip Van Winkle. Uh, there was smoking in the restaurants. It was very homophobic. And that's not the Michigan I remembered. And suddenly, Katie Fahey, uh, this young woman who sent a Facebook text out right before Thanksgiving, and she said, does anybody want to help me work on gerrymandering? Um, because she was dreading the conversation at Thanksgiving with her family total amateur when it comes to political work. And, and neither Republicans or Democrats in the state of Michigan really wanted, to, this is one of our recommendations, right? Public control over drawing congressional districts. She did not know that it was impossible to do. And she recruited people from all over Michigan who never had been involved in anything political. Um, and against all odds, passed this ballot initiative on the first try, you know, to take over redistricting in the state of Michigan. And I was so proud. It was like, oh, my state is. And so I think all it takes is pick one issue, pick one issue that is right, you know, or like you've already done right choice voting. My, my question is, when people have a sense of that civic power and civic agency because they came together, how do they win one thing and then go on to do the next, right? It's like you could just march right through this, this report and say, well, what's, what's, what's doable in the state of Maine? Who are the champions? That, because you're right, I think if we pay too much attention to the divisiveness that we hear about on the news all the time, it's hard. But, but as you said, in our own communities, we don't see people as red or blue. We just see them as our neighbors. And we probably, I, I, there's such great proof too, it's something you said earlier, when a diverse group of people um, can sit down together for a certain period of time with good information that is fair and balanced, and they have great facilitation, they will discover so much that they have in common, even though they walked into the room on both sides, whether it's immigration or healthcare, you name the issue. Um, so we, we know that when people have time to act like citizens and do good work, they come away, I guess, having renewed hope that our democracy can work among everyday people. But there aren't many places you can go, as you said, where there isn't either just total polarized shouting and yelling. But my hope is that in our own communities, that's not what people want. You know, they can see that in Congress, you know. It's like, that's not us, you know, which is funny. We keep electing those people and they misbehave down in Washington, but that's not how we behave in, back in our own. Yeah. Chris had raised the question that the, the things that are on top of his mind really are, is election finance. And it, in, in several, there are several of the items here that relate to election finance. And I'm wondering whether that feels to me like um, there's a lot of, um, that could easily be turned into something partisan. And P Peter said something that sounded to me hopeful that there are uh, people on both sides of the political aisle who think that it's a good idea 
Yeah, well, there are, there are a few recommendations that that relate to um, campaign finance. And, and so the, the Constitution, so one thing I know, uh, I think roughly 20 states have passed resolutions endorsing a constitutional amendment on campaign finance. I don't know if Maine is one of them. Probably you all would know if that had happened there. Um, that's so that's a non that's not a binding that's not the legislature formally approving the amendment because I don't think that um, but it's a, a it's a resolution of support um, so it's at least a mechanism for showing uh, that the legislature and representing the uh, the public in those twenty states uh, believe it's a good idea and it can help build support for uh, an amendment's introduction so that's one step on the uh, on the constitutional amendment. Um, process that a number of states have taken. And uh, certainly the folks, our friends at American Promise could um, provide you know, more guidance on, on, on how that's gone and, and, and how to go about that. Um, and then there are other, you know, there are uh, some of these that are really targeted more at the states, um, which is the you know, campaign finance disclosure laws, um, which is really um, around, you know, kind of bring transparency to some of the dark money that's uh, being contributed to political campaigns. Um, and uh, sort of clean election laws, including, um, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, mechanisms that can help uh, magnify the impact of small donations. So that could be public funds or vouchers that, um, uh, uh, in a sense, match uh, small donations. So they give the small donors a little bit more uh, leverage in, in, uh, in, in, with, you know, in, in opposition to or uh, 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 you know, big, big donors uh, contributions. So those are two things that really um, uh, are important at the state level um, and have been passed in several areas. What, one of the recommendations in the report is to have automatic uh, voter registration, pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds. Um, in uh, some several small cities here in Maryland, um, they have given 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote in the local elections. Um, it was a surprising idea for me the first time I heard about it. Um, and then but the social science on 16 and 17 year olds thoughts and opinions about public policy, especially those things that matter to them in their, in their local towns. Um, they're every bit as sophisticated and as thoughtful as 25 year olds, and they don't all vote like their parents. Um, and so the idea that I mean, it, it really, it hurts me to think that every 18 year old doesn't just rush out and register to vote. You know, finally I have a voice, um, you know, and, and so I think as well, it's because they've had no experience, but I think 16 year olds, you know, so it'd be fun if it, it maybe some of the smaller towns in Maine would take that up, you know, and just say in local elections, we're gonna let 16, 17 year olds vote. Um, see what kind of debate that and see if the young people line up at the microphone to convince the adults of, of how smart and thoughtful and you know they are um i don't know it's just it's not in our report we didn't recommend that <laughs> well we, we didn't just, we did recommend early early registration for 16 and 17 year olds yeah. but i think there was some that we didn't yeah. couldn't get a consensus on on lowering the voting voting age but uh and strategy two talks about uh voting empowering voters and some some election reforms and uh, Sterling mentioned automatic voter registration and same day registration. Um, you know, another one that I think is seeing some bipartisan support in terms of making voting easier or preserving some of the things during the 2020 election that made voting easier uh, is early voting. Um, and so I think uh, Kentucky, for example, um, has expanded early voting. It's a pretty, pretty red state. Um, and so, and even some of the fairly partisan state level legislation that um, uh, is controversial for other reasons. Uh, some of that legislation, I think, includes expansion of early voting. So that might be a place where it's where, uh, an easy win for building some bipartisan support. It makes it easier for everybody to vote. Um, uh, it doesn't bring up some of the questions of confidence or security with, with conservatives or some of the other ideas do. Okay, there's an elephant in the room here, it seems to me, that, that I'm not sure you guys have touched on anywhere. And that is the fact that the political space is dominated by two great big businesses who are a, a, an oligarchy. There's no room in those two big businesses for anything that's outside of what those two big businesses want to do. It seems to me that if you're really going to open up the civic space, you've got to do something about these, these, these businesses. Um, 
Is there any discussion about that? For instance, the League of Women Voters, I'm old enough to remember when they ran the presidential debates and they weren't circuses, they were information devices. Um, that isn't the case today. You have two political parties that are really just two businesses competing with each other and uh, semi-monopolies. What do you do about that? Yeah, I mean, I th it's a good point. I think reform of the political parties and the party system was not um, something the commission really explicitly looked at, though I do think there are some recommendations and ranked choice voting is one of them that um, try to get at introducing greater competition right into the elections. I mean, I, I think one of the merits of ranked choice voting is that um, it allows people to vote their conscience for an independent candidate without worrying about swinging it to a, a, a highly undesirable candidate um, or feeling like their vote, vote is wasted because they have the opportunity to register a second or third choice. Um, and so I do think, you know, part of the idea behind that was, um, you know, where there, I think there were two parts to the motivation. One was to um, force candidates to build a broader coalition because you've got to worry about not just your first choice core supporters, but people who, you know, hopefully will also at least consider you for a second or third choice, um, but also to um, open the way for more legitimate, serious third party or independent uh, candidate challenges to the two parties. And so I think um, that's one dimension where it is included here is this is the, the idea of competition and that could you know, sort of break this this duopoly uh, between the two parties, or at least keep the two parties honest by knowing that there's a possibility of serious con con uh, competition being introduced. Chris, have you heard of Catherine Gell and Michael Porter's book, The Politics Industry and uh, Breaking the Duopoly of the Two-Party System? Um, I think you would really appreciate, you know, um, Catherine Gell was a successful CEO of their family business, I think, uh, food business in the state of Wisconsin, Michael Porter's longtime Harvard business professor, strategy for business. And when they turned their attention to the political process, they they said, you know, the, the system is not broken. It, it, it works exactly the way those two parties want it to work. Um, and so it is fixed in the sense it's, it's fixed, it's, it's rigged. Um, and for those of us who may have been partisans throughout our lives, you know, you know, you step back and you say, hmm, over, over the long term, neither one of these seems to be solving our public problems. And um, so, yeah, this was not, this was not part of the commission's work, but, but Catherine Gell was instrumental in the campaign in Alaska, you know, because they, what, what some of these civic entrepreneurs are doing now, they're looking at the, all the recommendations in, in our report and others, and they're saying, okay, in Alaska, they discovered if they if they went for open primaries and ranked choice voting, in other words, an instant runoff, so that anybody can can run in a primary and everybody gets to vote. So there's no Republican or Democratic primary. That again, as Peter said, that allows for more people uh, across the spectrum to at least get their hat in the ring. Right. Um, and then the, and the top four or five then get to go in front of the electorate in a ranked choice voting. Um, and and I think there might have been some campaign finance reform also in the Alaska election. They were like, they bundled, they bundled these reforms. And I think they have some insights around, hmm, don't just go for ranked choice voting all by itself. You know, it crashed and burned in Massachusetts, uh, we all saw. We're thinking like, huh, um, I guess, you know, I guess change doesn't always happen naturally. Um, but I think, I think you find a lot of allies that say, we have to break this, you know, this duopoly. Um, and as Peter said, right choice voting obviously especially allows people to not divide, you know, if two people look kind of similar, uh, you know, then they don't want to compete for the, the scarce vote, but in ranked choice voting, obviously, I can just, I can go right down the list. Um, so I think, I think there is some hope on the horizon, although it's, you have to be careful who you say this in front of, you call them, the, I guess you said, you meant to say there's a big elephant and a big donkey in the room. Uh, correct. That, that's exactly right. Well, and hopefully some of the campaign finance reforms would, would address it as well, too. I mean, there's probably a donor-driven homogeneity to um, the party platforms that, uh, you know, could be disrupted a little bit by uh, empowering uh, smaller donors uh, in these races. 
I think I think what also is happening, which is new new on the scene, is how business, the business world, uh, the business sector is now having to ask themselves: um, Should they put they they would have no interest in giving up the ability to fund campaigns, right? And they pretty much fund both sides, right? They put a lot of money in. They don't, they want to cover their bets. Um, but now I think the business sector is saying, you know, if this democracy fails, um, I, on, on one Zoom call, there's a group called the Leadership Now Project, um, organizing business leaders to speak out for democracy. And one vice president of a large company in Wisconsin, I think, said, uh, we have to change how we teach business education. In business schools and in companies, we're taught our only concern about government is how we manipulate it. <laughs> and that, we have to change that. We have to say that's not the point anymore because we can manipulate government, but as our society starts to fall apart, it's like, so where do we run our business and how do we sell our products when um, we can't even fix the bridges, right? Um, so it'd be interesting to see if business puts democracy first and where they come out, especially when you put these campaigns in front of the voters. And I, we understand that your last, last campaign almost all the media time was thought up by outside interests so that you, you could not get your voice heard um, in, in front of the people. And that was a kind of a scary experience, I think, for people to see the power of money, especially the power of outside money coming into local elections. And, um, so I think it'll be, it'll be interesting to watch. So, Chris, nobody else. Um, for about 10 years, I've chaired the budget committees for the town and for the county, both. And the town, I think, does an extraordinary job of being transparent about their budget. They start with department meetings, which are open to the public. They have select board meetings, groups which are open to the public. We have at least five budget committee meetings that are open to the public, where we go through the entire budget then there's a public hearing, and then there's a town meeting, and then we vote on it, okay, finally. That takes about seven months. And I can't remember in the last couple of years anybody showing up for any of those meetings. We have pictures at Central Hall in the Commons of town meetings from the 50s, and Central Hall was packed with 400 people, all with suits and ties and best dresses on. And uh, they voted for everything, on everything, one way or the other. But that's all gone now. Do you find that elsewhere in the country? Is there, are there any bright spots in that desert? Great question. <laughs> I don't know, Sterling, you, you would have more perspective than maybe we do from at the academy. But I, I am trying to think of some. I, I think some of, some of our commissioners would be quicker to say, yes, let me tell you about Akron, Ohio, or let me, but I, I'm not sure though, Chris, whether it's at public meetings per se, or it's at other kinds of public gatherings where, where there's there's a local culture that's that's getting people to come out again. Um, but I think you raised the threshold question, which is people are, are hardworking, they're busy, um, they don't have time for democracy, right? And, and if, I, if, if I've heard anything in the last few weeks, it's like, Animals. Democracy is hard. It, it's really hard. It's not easy. It takes time and energy. And and of course, I, I was before the internet. I thought if we could just ban television on Thursday nights, then on Thursday nights you have to go to a public meeting. You, <laughs> you, you can't get in, you can't get entertained at home. You can't watch your favorite sitcom or you can't watch movies. You have to go to a public meeting. You know. And uh, I mean, now, in the report, of course, we do call for mandatory voting. You know, we recommend the Australian system, which is you have to show up on election day. We can't force you to vote, but you have to show up. Uh, otherwise, we're going to fine you $25 or something, you know. And it, but it was like trying to make voting a sense of civic duty, like jury duty. Um, so I don't, I think the inventiveness of local places to make, um, make public meetings more fun and more engaging, um, I know. I know one local city council person, like you, Chris, uh, I, I, I asked him you know, how he survived many years of being thank the thankless job and people yelling in public meetings. And he said, well, we have a Boy Scout troop attend every one of our city, city council meetings. And with the Boy Scouts in the room, 
the adults tend to behave. Huh. And I thought, I said, that's interesting. It's usually the adults making the kids behave, but in this case, it was just the opposite. Well, we could bring some nuns in, I guess. <laughs> or Boy Scouts. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. Do, do you, in general, when you've been talking and when you were going through this process of evolving our common purpose and going around the country, did you get a sense that people all around the country are feeling that democracy is in trouble? I think it was a, a, a mixed sense, and I'd invite Sterling to, 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 and Catherine to chime in, but I, my, my, my sense is that it was mixed. There was some despair that things were indeed broken and not working, um, and that that was a shared sense of despair across the ideological and demographic spectrum, um, but that there was also optimism that people did, um, you know, I, at least there was a number of reasons to be optimistic. Their shared, shared love of country was very um, evident in these conversations, um, but also a, a, you know, a belief that we could fix this, that we could restore trust in one another, and we could restore trust in our institutions. I mean, I think maybe that's um, some of the famed American optimism um, coming coming across, you know, together with with you know concern about where we are and the level of dysfunction. Yeah, that that, um, that as Peter said, the one consistent thing across all the listening sessions and with very different kinds of folks gathered was the, this, this enduring love of country. Um, and I thought, wow, if you can, that's, that's a great thing you can work on. You know, people love this country, but then when pushed to say, so what does that mean in terms of common values or then it was like, it was open field running. It's like, well, I don't know. Uh, but as Peter said, the statistics, I'm trying, I think they're in the report, Peter, um, 84% of people, I think, said they thought we could do, we could create more trust in our government, more trust in our institutions, more trust in each other. So that was really high in their belief we could, we could, as, as Peter said. So I was like, whoa, that's a big number. Um, but again, I think as you're saying, so what are the handholds? How, how do I make this come to life in my community right now? Um, because as I said earlier, we hope we can create this national trust for civic infrastructure. We can attract more philanthropic dollars um, to go into supporting democratic work. You know, so we come up with, I mean, let's have a contest in the high schools. You know, let, let's say like, well, so you design a public meeting to talk about a local issue. You know, how would you do it? Um, we've had so much innovation in the technology world, you know, human-centered design. I think our democracy is just waiting, you know, for people to say, to answer Chris's question, you know, like, okay, how come nobody comes to these meetings anymore? Um, and so I, I know in corporations, they're like, okay, don't have boring meetings, you know, put something in front of people. But as I said earlier, I think if you entice people to come and talk about what good civic education could mean, you might get a lot of people coming out, you know, and you probably have to prepare yourself or maybe have some ground rules, but it's probably like, well, what's there to talk about that, that I care about? Yeah, I know we have just a little bit of time left. I mean, I think the civic education piece sounds like a great next step in terms of, um, you know, conversations at Central Hall Commons. And uh, just to bring it back to strategy one, just want to um, definitely heard that there's a strong concern around the campaign finance things and looking at ways that um, some of those ideas could be advanced at the state level. Uh, I'm wondering if there are others in your ranked choice voting. We've all, you know, can check that box. <laughs> uh, independent citizen redistricting commissions. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, has that been adopted in Maine or, um, or not, not, not yet? I mean, that's another one. And uh, you know, uh, Sterling had a great story about um, how it came about in Michigan. Um, that, could be, that could be another one or, and, and maybe a relatively uh, you know, easier win uh, in the state than some. Um, another one I wanted to bring attention to is, is a, a, a kind of a longer term idea, uh, uh, somewhat newer idea that uh, we hope to socialize is um, to substantially enlarge the House of Representatives. So I know, um, you know, the, the Central Highlands and Maine sit within a very large uh, congressional district, the second congressional district. It's a big geographical area, um, probably incorporates a lot of people. Part of the idea behind this is, um, you know, to help uh, improve the, the level of connection between constituents and their representative in Congress. I mean, a district of 750,000 people and you have 
some, you know, a district like the second district in Maine, which is huge. You have districts like the entire state of Wyoming, which is even bigger. Um, you know, it, it makes it really difficult to have a, a meaningful relationship as a constituent to a representative in Congress. And this matters not just from a policy deliberation or having a voice on, you know, whatever legislation is from, coming in front of Congress, but also because members of Congress really serve as ombudsmen that, you know, help citizens navigate federal bureaucracy um, and advocate for citizens who have challenges or problems with uh, federal agencies that they interact with, whether that's the VA or Social Services Administration. So um, we're, you know, really interested in uh, this idea and, and hope that you would give some thought to how it might change your experience living in a district like the sec second district in Maine. If that, if you had, if that were split up into more districts and you had, didn't have to travel as far to connect with uh, your representative uh, at, at home or, uh, you know, didn't have to uh, compete with thousands of other people trying to email or call uh, your representative's office. So I'd be interested in any reactions to that before, before we close. I'm curious, Leslie and Gloria, what you would think of the notion of, uh, of more districts. Gloria, do you want to comment on that? I have some thoughts, but I've spoken a lot. Actually, I am in favor of uh, an increasing the number of people that would be um, in the House of Representatives um, simply for the reason, well, actually there's several reasons, but um, if I heard correctly, this has been uh, what we have right now we have had since what 1929 yeah. or a great a long time and uh everything has changed there's so many more um people that the the house of representatives represent and there's no way that they can uh um have a meaningful relationship and um, advocate for their people um because there's just too many of them there and there's only two in the state, right? Two in the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, I don't see how they can have any meaningful representation. And the key word I wrote down was om ombudsman. Um, and how can they even advocate for anyone that's having difficulties? I, I think it's even difficult to get in touch with them. Um, so I'm all in favor of that. And it may be something, if it's doable, it may be something that we might want to tackle. Well, I think, I think it's a, a, an interesting idea. I have some practical questions around it. One of the practical questions is how many is too many? Um, and, and from a practical point of view, how many people, how would you manage the House of Representatives? I don't mean you, but how would our government handle a House of Representatives that had, you know, 700 people in it. Yeah, um, those, those yeah. are great questions. I should mention the Academy has convened a working group to think about those questions. So the commission um, recommended substantial increase, at least 50, but that, that we should have a debate and discussion about, you know, how many. And so we're, we're sort of carrying on that uh, uh, discussion uh, and follow up to the report. And we'll certainly share, share the results of that uh, with you. I think there'll be a a small report that comes out with, with recommendations on that. But that's what those, those are some of the questions we've grappled with is um, balancing practicality and the, you know, uh, of the physical capacity and, and uh, the Capitol building and other office buildings, but also, you know, how big becomes unwieldy. You also want your members of Congress to be able to um, probably build relationships with one another more effectively than they currently do. Um, so there's, there may be a size that becomes uh, too many. And then what's the principle we want also to appeal to principles that um, are compelling to uh, you know liberals, centrists, and conservatives, um, and, and so you know I think a, you know a couple ideas would be um, you know at least uh, you know with redistricting you have places where people are losing a district um, because of uh, changes in the allocation of the population around the country. So at least you know try to preserve the what representation people already have. Uh, another idea is to sort of you know equalize the size of districts so that um, you know, I think uh, um, there are certain states that uh, every state has at least one representative, but if you have a state like Wyoming with a small population, well, then at least every other district should have a similar population to Wyoming. So these could be a couple so that there's a sort of, you know, one person, one vote or, you know, 500,000 people, one representative uh, ratio that's consistent across districts and equitable. 
Um, and then also like, let's stop taking away representatives from states, you know, if they haven't lost, lost population, right? Just because some other states are growing faster. Um, one of the things I'm involved with some equity projects in Maine, and one of the things that is that comes up is the question of whether the equity is related to rurality or whether it's related to economics or whether it's related to racial equity. And in this, in this state, you have a very good example of a situation where you've got, we already feel like we're, the, the second district already feels like it's a different Maine than the first district. So the first district is more urban, it's Portland centered, very um, much more diverse. Um, and then you've got a less diverse population in the second district. And if you are in Piscataquis County, you feel like you're not represented because Bangor has such a heavy weight uh, it, it, from a population point of view, Bangor outweighs all the other surrounding rural districts and rural areas in terms of the weight of decision making when you're talking about state politics. And so, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of questions that come up in in this issue. And frankly, I'm not convinced that adding more representatives in Maine would be likely to increase our representation, my personal representation. Um, it might decrease my representation, honestly. Um, so um, not that that's not, that's fine, but I think rural people in Maine might be less enfranchised. My suspicion is that if you had another representative in Maine, it would end up representing the middle section of Maine, um, which may be a more um, racially diverse uh, urban population. Um, and I don't think it would necessarily increase the representation for rural people in the second district. So I, just throwing that out there. I, I, think, I think you all may be um, particularly threatened as Peter was saying with the, the next census, I, I recall seeing an article saying, depending on who grows and who shrinks, you're right on that cusp with 1.4 million people to have two, two Congress people. And it, this article said, you know, Maine could lose one if, you know, because you're so close to that formula. So more, at least more representation would probably protect you <laughs> from losing that second congressperson right now, and and if, if, if you know at least you might not gain another one depending on how many were added. But if right now, as Peter was saying, you stand to lose one if the population calculations are just on that. And there was another state that they used as an example where people are the most represented because they're close to that, and they're the least represented because they're you know because of how the formula. Given current politics, that would really be something that would appeal to Republicans, because the Republican part of the state is the northern part of the state, and the southern part of the state is the reason why the the elected representative, the representation we have, is what it is, is because it's very much more heavily democratic in the larger cities, more diverse populations, and so actually, if we want to sell that. That's the talking point um, in this community would be to save that second uh, representative to be representing the rural northern Maine population that is primarily very conservative. Yeah, Chris. It'd be a for Maine to get behind that. <laughs> Guys, this is an argument, a question that, that bedeviled the founders in, in, the, in the Congress, that forming the Congress is why we have senators and representatives there is no answer to that. The truth of the matter is that rural areas like ours are declining in significance. What were what, 10% of the population now, something like that. This is an argument that's always going to go on. I'm not sure how that would work. My suspicion is that it really comes down to having more staff if you're a congressperson to be serving your constituents. That's another thing that's to be talked about. But let me ask you guys, as you talk to Congress, what's their sense about this approach? Yeah, I mean, we've just had some initial initial conversations and I think there is openness and interest. There's even, I won't mention them because they haven't introduced it yet, but there is somebody who's working on legislation 
um, to enlarge the House. There's other legislation that uh, uh, has been introduced that called for a commission to um, examine this issue, the number of representatives, but also the means of electing them. Okay. Um, so it's 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 beginning to enter the discourse there, um, uh, but it's it's early days. This isn't widespread, and um, you know I think uh, yeah, I mean I, I think you know, we have to develop those talking points uh, to different members of Congress from from either party that that can begin to sort of engage them on this issue and socialize it. I'm sensitive to the time. I realize we're just about out of our time. This has been a fantastic discussion and really uh, helpful to us. I mean, I think we've uh, you know, really learning about how, how these things are viewed in, by you all in Maine and, and how, how they're relevant or um, resonate uh, uh, locally. Um, Tara, maybe I'll turn it back to you just for our last minute to talk about uh, what's next in terms of OCP conversations. Thank you so much, Peter, Catherine, Sterling, for um, sharing all of your insights and, and talking with us tonight. Um, yeah, our, our next conversation in this series is scheduled for September 2nd at four o'clock. And I will say that I'm open to um, rearranging the order of the strategies as we move through these conversations. So. Um, as you look through the report, if, if you have an interest or feel like it's um, appropriate to really focus on a different strategy next and to reorder them, please do let me know and, and we'll do our best to make that happen. Um, any closing comments from everybody? Thank you so much, Gloria, Chris, uh, Leslie, for, for all of your interactions and Shauna and John for, for joining the call as well. My thought, closing thought is Nothing works unless we get the money out of the politics and out of the political system. That includes the uh, media. That's the first step. Not won't fix it, but it's the first step. It's a necessary condition. Gloria. I have a question is um, over the last, when you were touring the country and talking to different groups and uh, diverse groups, uh, you've mentioned throughout the discussion today different percentages, like 84 uh, percent wanted to uh, have more trust in their govern governance. Um, do you know if the uh, sentiments have changed substantially since January 6th? Has, has um, the feel of the country or, or some of the groups that you've worked with, have they... Um, changed their sentiment at all since January 6th? Do you know that? I don't know. I mean, I think the uh, data that you cited, Sterling, is maybe from the Pew uh, Charitable Trust um, sentiment polling. And I don't know if they've issued, uh, will have issued new um, polling results since January 6th. It would certainly be interesting, interesting to see that. I mean, I think at January 6th presents a little bit of an opportunity. I, I think the sense of urgency that we hear with audiences has, has increased. So just anecdotally, not based on poll numbers, uh, people, I, th I think, understand the depths of the crisis a little bit more in light of those, um, those events. There, there were two, two reports we heard about uh, earlier this week from more in common, uh, one on the, the American fabric, our sense of identity, and our sense of distrust, um, some fascinating statistics and data on how each side views the other side. Um, but I agree with Peter. I, I think if people thought our, our democracy was in trouble, January 6th certainly um, brought that uh, right to, to the front of everyone's mind. But I thought well, that we have so many good people working on bridging the divides. Uh, other people have said, I, I don't want to just focus on bridging divides. I want to sit down and work on something, you know, on something positive, you know, and um, well, our friends in the bridging divide world are just trying to, as Leslie was saying, just people discover the common humanity of somebody who you thought was different from you. And then, but to me, it's like, that's why the name of the report, Our Common Purpose, to me is so, so perfect. You know, people, I think people want to sit down and work on something that they, that they could solve together. And if, if we can find ways to create those spaces, um, it, it just it just changes people. It gets their attention away from these narratives of divisiveness and gets it to more like, wow, I had a positive experience in, with my democratic freedoms, and and it was so real that you know that's that's what I think we we want to be a part of and help build that opportunity experience for all of our, our 
daily basis. I just want to thank you guys, um, all of you for coming and all of the participation today. I feel hopeful that at the Commons, we're on the right track and that we're doing that this community, we have potential in this community to make those small changes in connectedness that's going to make a difference. And I think that's, that's what we're gonna to have to keep doing. So, but I'm really uh, grateful to hear this conversation and let's keep doing it. Thank you so much, Leslie. I'm just gonna close by sharing um, the values that the Central Hall Commons Board um, has, has generated on our screen and um, have a great night and a great Independence Day with your loved ones. Thank you.